You're listening to the Results Driven Organizations podcast with Dr. Tanya Lowe, a podcast of curated conversations with C-suite leaders and those who support organizational growth and development. Get ready for inspiring interviews, educational lessons, and thought-provoking discussions that will challenge you to execute something new and innovative that will drive results in your organization. And now, here's Dr. Tanya Lowe. Hello, you're listening to episode 15 of the Results Driven Organizations podcast with Dr. Tom Yellow, using my results driven philosophy of strategy, leadership, teams, and customer experiences. I help organizations develop their best kept secret, their human capital. Our guest today is Gerald Estime. Gerald is the vice president of real estate for Levi Strauss and Company, where he res- where he is responsible for all of the company's real estate business in the Americas, which means he and his team are responsible for non-comp store growth. Well, what does that mean? It it includes expansion, retraction, lease renewals, dispositions, relocations, or any other real estate transaction. Gerald is no stranger to real estate or leadership. His previous roles consist of director of national mall portfolio for Starbucks and senior director for real estate for Gap Incorporated. When Gerald is not wrangling multi-million dollar real estate deals, he enjoys giving back by coaching young athletes in baseball and basketball. In addition to being an influencer in the corporate real estate space, Gerald is a husband, father, and a doctoral student. Gerald, welcome to RDO. Thank you, Tanya. That's a, a great introduction. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So, so let's jump right in. What was it about Levi Strauss and Company that attracted you to to them? You know, was it their mission? Was it their values? Was it you know what was it? Well, it was it was a few things. It was it's the opportunity and the timing for me matched up well, almost perfectly. Um, you know, I had my plan for what was probably uh, eighteen months out for more almost two years. I wanted to get my son out of college and or get off to college and then kind of get back into hitting the road and uh, continuing to, you know, continue with the career. I took a step back and wanted to really spend more time with him through his final year of high school and recruiting as an athlete and uh, or is an athlete and thought I'd wait uh, a little bit before going back out and looking. But the thing that attracted me and made me pause is the strength of the brand mm-hmm. um, and basically the opportunity that it had in the states and abroad. Um, looking at uh, the brand was a 160 year old uh, manufacturer, mm-hmm. but still an infant in terms of retail and opportunities in the Americas and the timing was perfect. Uh, understanding that there was so much run room, so much opportunity for improvement in the organization and just in terms of the one, two, threes of, of operations. Um, we had tremendous run room. And that that really was the opportunity I looked at and said, this is a good opportunity to be a part of it. The second thing was the culture. Um, mm-hmm. You know, as we reach our middle years, um, we start to understand that culture becomes a much more heavily weighted factor in decisions, right? What's the environment I'm going to be in? Mm-hmm. Uh, when you're young, you don't care. You want the opportunity. You want the money. You want the glamour. And the, the environment you, you take with the grain of salt. Um, as you age, you start to say, hey, listen, I spent a lot of time in this environment. The culture is extremely important. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I came from a culture that was completely opposite of what was being presented to me. And there were things about it that I really, really valued. Um, there is something to be said about a California-based company. Mm. Something to be said about legislature, legislation that creates an environment. And that's the purpose of legislation. Right. Right. So California's legislation is heavily weighted towards uh, the employee. And the companies reflect that as a result of it. And it creates a culture um, in those organizations that I think show true um, for the employees that operate in them. You don't really realize it until you no longer have that. Um, I had it, you know, some years prior with another California-based company. Mm-hmm left, went to another company and realized, wow, there's some stark differences. Um, And I I value that. Going back here, looking at the opportunity, the culture and everyone I I spoke to really shined bright. Um, And that that probably was the second thing that, you know, was most important that attracted me. 
to, to go into the United States. You know, Gerald, um, there are several people that say, and I don't know who coined the phrase that culture eats strategy for breakfast. You know, mm-hmm. organizational culture is so important. And, you know, as I looked at um, the Levi Strauss and Company brand, you know, I was very impressed with their Red Cap Foundation and their the work that they're doing around diversity, equity, inclusion, and just how they really embrace the um, the the family concept, if you will, that you know our employees matter, and I think that's really important. Um, it's not something that we're taught when we're in school, right? It's you know get the grades, get the job, and I think it's something that we learn o- along the way of what type of culture we want to be involved in um, as we mature, right? Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm, so I'm gonna generalize a little bit here. Okay. I think our generation, and I know our generation. Yes, that, yes, we're it. in the same box. But exactly. <laughs> so our generation, yes, right? It was about the GEs of the world. It was mm-hmm. about the big consulting firms. It was about um, those type of conglomerates and what right. it meant to be in those conglomerates, right? It was, it was not dog eat dog, but it was, a culture of this is big business and what happens with it coming off their 80s and going into the 90s. Corporate um, culture wasn't necessarily about the culture of the people. It was about the culture of the dynamics of how they operate business. Mm -hmm. You look at today's young employee, they're more so about what do we do? What can I speak to that speaks to who I am as a person? Absolutely. Speaks to who I aspire to be um, socially. Right. So mm-hmm. how can I be a part of something socially that I that represents me or represents my imagery on social media or who I am for as a person? Right. So they're much more in tune with it than we ever were. Absolutely. And I think companies recognize that, but as a consumer and as an employee, right? Employees ask those questions. And you know, I've been looking for a couple of open positions. There are questions about culture that we get today that we didn't, I didn't get 10 years ago, 15 yeah. years ago. Yeah. And I think that speaks to the differences in how people see that as an important factor today. Yeah, um, yeah. And again, I just don't think my generation tuned into it during that time. So. Yeah, the workplace is definitely changing. So I want to I want to switch gears a little bit. You are no stranger to leadership. You've held several leadership roles in your career. How important is it to you to have a strong team? And what are some things that Levi's is doing to cultivate and maintain a strong team during COVID-19? And can you share some of your personal team secrets with us? Yes. And I'll tell you, I, I'm i trying not to make too many analogies. To okay. No, we love analogies. <laughs> but to me, I think those were, those are the things that taught me the most, mm. right? So coaching my son's teams and coaching, coaching kids, understanding the dynamics or watching good coaches and bad coaches, mm. understanding the differences and dynamics. And they always don't translate to um, the winning as teams, but good coaching and mentoring shows up in a lot of ways that you can translate to developing teams and business. Um, for me, I think, you know, there's always that phrase about one bad apple, right? Um, mm-hmm. But I think if you allow the culture to tolerate that, it will permeate your environment. Absolutely. And I think it's important that we look for good people. Uh, I think that was something that assured me that I made a good choice at Levi's. And I use it as an example of questions that come up about culture when I'm interviewing others. When I was being hired, my boss was not in place. The person who hired me was a couple levels up. She was over president. And she was thinking about pausing. My CEO said, no, hire good people. Mm-hmm. And a good person who comes in behind it will appreciate that you hired a good person in place, right? So that that to me spoke volumes that there was a culture for assuring that there were qualified, good people in place, mm-hmm. and others that you hire in like fashion will kind of also appreciate that. So right. um, I think when you create your teams, you keep those things in, in mind. When I think about a team, it's just that, right? You have a collection of components that all work together to create um, a well-oiled machine, right? Mm-hmm. To execute to what your target goals are. If you get all the same position, 
you won't be a good team. If you get all of the same skill sets, you won't be a good team. If I get everyone who thinks, walks, and talks, and looks like me, it's not a great team, mm -hmm. right? Just because you, you can all say yes to my ideas. Um, no one is challenged in that sense. No one, <laughs> no one grows. Right? Do you have a healthy environment for healthy friction, for healthy debate? Um, you know, I don't take myself that serious. Uh, when you hear me use the phrase I, or truly speaking to I, when I'm talking about uh, a dynamic related to a team, nobody works for me, I'm a part of the team. Mm -hmm. And I get very uncomfortable with the phrase I. I did this, I completed that, I was able to talk, you know, it, it's we. Um, and I kind of, I, I really work hard to instill that in our teams, that it's a we culture. Uh, and when you start to do that and you start to think we, then the accomplishments become we, the accolades become we. When somebody takes the heat, I'm happy to take it because that's what my seat calls for. Right? Right. That's, that's the purpose of it. But right. if everyone understands that they're going to get the praises for the execution and that they have somebody who has their back when they're thing if, you, if you're afraid to fail, you can never succeed. And I say it with players. If I'm going to yank a player out of the game the second they make a mistake, they'll never function at a high level. Yeah. And it's the same thing in, in, in the corporate world. We want people to, to go forward with their ideas and test and try and go and be, up, be entrepreneurial and execute. You've got to give them some runway to do so. Yeah. Second thing is, go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. You go ahead. I, the second thing is you got to create that environment, right? Like that environment of saying, you know, I'm not hearing from you. I want to hear from you. Tell, tell me more. What do you think? Um, putting things out there and sharing. I think one of the things I try to do is be a little bit verbose, right? I want to explain my thinking. Right. I want clarity, right? I want that clarity to be shared because perfect clarity will, you know, to me, I'll perform a perfect plan at any time for a team because a team has clarity on what they're trying to execute and they can then adjust to anything that comes about. Perfect plan will always go right because there's always things and always obstacles. There's always things that you can't foresee. It's never really I perfect, is it? It's not really perfect, right? <laughs> I don't care how much machine learning you apply to it, right? So uh, having perfect clarity allows people to make the adjustments that they need to give them the freedom to understand where we come from, but then also to challenge it and to say, hey, have we thought about this? What do we think about that? Yeah. And I'll tell you, it's it's, re it's refreshing to hear people feel like they can come to the table and they can share. Yeah. Or pushing forward. And you have to create a healthy environment. There's a little bit of training sometimes for people who feel like they can do it. A little bit of training for people sometimes to understand how do we do it. Right? Yes. We, we have to do it in a healthy way. We have to do it in a respectful way. And I always say to people, there's only one non-starter on my team. And that's respect. We will not operate in an in a environment that's respectful. Yeah. Um, and you know, I've been in those environments where they're not, and, and I, I refuse at this juncture. I, I, lo I love what you said about you know they're creating this space where people feel like it's okay for me to join the conversation. It's okay for me to add my ideas, um, and that they have to be taught that. You know, when I go into organizations and I'm helping people um, understand the the function or dysfunction of their teams, one of the things that I hear a lot of times is that they don't feel safe to share or it is a one-sided, you know, it's all about the manager or the director and we don't get our, in, we don't get to in, add input or they come from an organization. If it's a culture where um, it's inclusive in, in thought and they want everyone's participation, they come from a culture where um, they didn't have that. So they they don't really feel comfortable with, you know, I'm, is it safe? Is it okay for me to speak and share and fail and, and make mistakes? And so I, I think it's great that you have um, created this, this atmosphere because that's where growth takes place. That's where, you know, if we're not challenged in our, our thinking, then we're not going to grow and if one team in an organization isn't growing, then that stifles the rest of the organization. I completely agree. But then you got to think about how you put your team together. Yes. Right? yes. So <laughs> when we talk about that growth, it's a collective, right? If I sat in the classroom, we all regret regression to the mean, right? We all regress to the mean. Yeah. Yeah. In the classroom, 
and I'm the smartest guy in the class and everyone is two levels below me. I'm going to regress to the mean, mm -hmm. which is scary, right? right? So am I comfortable enough putting smarter people around me? Am I comfortable enough putting mm -hmm. experts around me that know more about the subject matter than I do? And then am I comfortable enough to trust that, to bring mm -hmm. it to a collective, mm -hmm. right? My role is to collect all that I know on a broader scale, leverage all of the experts to help make the right decisions, to help motivate, to help inspire those on that team. Right. And that's the, you know, that's the trick, right? That's coaching. Right. right? That's, Absolutely. That's how do I get the most out of them? How do I prod and poke to get more out of them? And everybody has a different love language. Everyone is motivated differently. How do I... Um, bring that collection together to execute to our goals. And I think it starts with that clarity yeah. and then that environment and then really putting the right people in place. Right? Oh, like I, if you have all those right people in place in that environment, it's primed to get there, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Gerald, I, I, what lessons, um, what are some of the lessons that your team has taught you over the years? We know that the key to reaching organizational success is to surround ourselves with people that we can co-create with, you know? So what are some of the lessons that you've learned from your teammates and your, your team members? I am a much different leader of teams than I have been. Right? <laughs> I never want to lead with the business card. Right? Yeah. Uh, I want to, and, and, and that means if I'm in a room, it doesn't matter who's in that room, if they're a board member or they're a, a entering you know, self-contributing manager. It's, I want to lead with the passion and the obsession I have to execute. And that doesn't mean I need to lead with the position that I hold. Mm. And what I've learned when I was a young leader is that I'm the leader, damn it, right? Like, we're, <laughs> I want to lead, I want to show that I'm the boss and I got the idea we're going to go with what I've, and, you know, uh, I remember it was a very simple aspect. But I, 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 I hearken back to this, this, you know, the old guy, like, get off my lawn. I'm stuck in the way I'm thinking. Yeah. I said, I never want to be there again. I had a couple of employees come to me before work from home was a big deal. And they wanted to work from home. And they really were pushing this whole thing about working from home. And uh, damn it, we don't do that in our roles. And it's not, you know. And we're not going to do that. And it was like, no one in the company was doing it. And they were saying, well, why shouldn't, you know, really challenging it. And I, and I was offended by the challenge. Ah. Right. And I look at that and go, wow. It was a way in which the world was headed. And I was too stubborn and too blinded, too naive in my new role to see it and be open to even hearing it. Mm -hmm. And I never want to be there again. Yeah. Right. I never, I never, and, and the lesson was the, the tiny one, luckily, right? So it wasn't about losing millions in business. Right. But it was about looking back at that lesson and saying, oh, you know, be more open, listen to, to think about it. What are the objectives? And we still able to achieve those objectives. And, um, you know, what does it cost me to allow those team members to be in a more comfortable setting? What does it cost me to hear their ideas? And I think about that and it's changed, you know, that changed me later on as I think back to that time, um, my, my rigidity, it, it just didn't, you know, but new leaders, you know, you go through that, right? It's, it's, Absolutely. I deal with that all the time when I go into organizations, you know, when you're a new leader, you're either using the, the skills and the framework that you were led by and you bring that. And um, it can be a struggle sometimes. I know that I dealt with that in my career. It took a long time for me to jump on the team bandwagon because I was always a, a department of, of one. I always excelled um, wonderfully as a team of one, but I struggled. And I talk about it in, in my book. I struggled um, when I, I had to lead a team that was around me every single day. Um, and it was a challenge, but they taught me so much. They taught me so much about why teams are important. And I use that in, in my business, in my business today. So I love that example. I love that example. It's always fun when you first start, like you go from individual contributor to 
and everybody struggles with the same thing. I said to my organization a couple of months ago, I was like, why we need a platform for that? <laughs> because it, you got to have some level of training and transition because every single person says what you just say yeah. in every walk of business, right? And yeah. we, it still persists to this day. We still let it go on. So You know, it's, it's, it's um, we're not taught we're taught how to excel individually, you know, unless you grow up in sports, but sometimes for some people, it doesn't translate into the workforce, but, you know, I could talk about all of the the accolades that I got individually, but how does that translate to me growing and nurturing and mentoring my team so that they can they can get some of those same things. So, and I see that now when I go into companies and, and I'm helping organizations, I see myself and I'm like, hey, I can help you with this because I was you. <laughs> <laughs> I was you, right? <laughs> so, Joe, you know, prior to COVID-19, leaders were faced with many challenges. What do you believe are the biggest challenges leaders face today? You know, I, I think we are on the precipice of some real challenges with employees in terms of bandwidth. Mm-hmm. And everyone was stretched prior to COVID-19. We saw the workforce reductions, people, people roles were consolidated. Obviously the use of technology has helped with that. But I think following COVID-19, we saw even more layoffs, you know, refining of roles, consolidation of roles. Mm-hmm. And People push through it, right? Everybody's holding on to their jobs and understanding, right? You had survivor's remorse and you're, you know, I'm com- I can't complain. I just think there's a breaking point. Mm-hmm. And I, I think how we manage that will be interesting. What are we doing with that? Right? We talk about uh, mental um, mental illness and, and, and challenges that people are faced with a lot. I think a lot of it has to do with the amount of stress that people are, are under. Um, and I think our work environments haven't help that. I think our work days now are average of 10 to 12 hours a day. Right. Nonstop breaks. People literally, you know, eat while they're on conference calls, prepare a meal, prepare their lunches while they're on conference calls, right? There's something unhealthy about it, right? Yeah. There, um, there's a reason, you know, you look at communities and there's been a lot of studies around communities that take siestas and the benefits of a siesta, right? Like, mm-hmm. but we see that in American culture. It's a badge of honor to work as hard as we do. So I think that's going to be one of the challenges when we think about people challenges right. going forward, right? right. And, and I, um, I don't think there's enough recognition of it. Mm-hmm. You know, following that, it's the business, right? Like it's, you know, the world has changed. A lot of businesses uh, have changed. We have yet to understand the full ramifications. What is the, how does this normalize long-term? Um, everyone is trying to guess that. You trying to utilize predictive modeling in every facet of what we do yeah. in the world today to try to predict and to meet those things to, to meet the customer, or meet the business needs where we're predicting it will be. Those are going to be some challenges of the unknown that we have to figure out. Like, how does the world normalize post COVID? And uh, I think there's a lot of businesses today that, that are hinged on that. We don't know. I'm in the retail business. What happens to bricks and mortar? How mm-hmm. do, shop? do people need to shop as much, right? We don't spend as much if we're not going into offices, right? We're not commuting as much as we used to. Right. Um, what happens to all of the aspects of what we consider to be normalcy for our entire lives going forward? You know, I think those unknowns we we have to we have to be and, and you have to make the right bets mm-hmm. um, to meet those. Which all goes back to um, bringing the right people. Hiring the right people, bringing the right people to the table, and and doing it together, not doing it in a in a silo. But it, it, that's that's true. I agree. It also goes back to the culture, right? Mm-hmm. Like how do you create a culture of flexibility, of agility, right? Because if you create a culture of agility, no matter which way you go, there's an ability to pivot. And I think what happens uh, with a number of companies is that. You don't have that. Uh, you don't have that agility. If you don't have that culture, it yeah. makes it hard to turn. You know, to turn a big ship around, right? Like yeah. 
It's, it's very, very difficult. But creating a culture of agility gives you the flexibility to shift to modify strategies to meet the marketplace. Um, that's hard. I, I'm going to tell you, for a large company, and it's hard. Yeah. Very, very hard. I yeah. give Starbucks a lot of credit. I worked for them for six years. There's a lot to be said about shortcomings, mm -hmm. but their ability to be agile, their willingness to pull the plug, their willingness to pivot, um, and their ability, their corporate ability to do so. I mean, they reorg constantly. Um, wow. Now, it creates some shortfalls in the culture, but in terms of a business model, it's, it's, uh, it allows them to be agile. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. That sounds like a good book, Gerald, you know, being agile, <laughs> how to be more <laughs> agile. I, I'm going to look for you to write that book, Dr. Estime. <laughs> only, only if we partner. Only if we partner. Hey, let's do <laughs> it. Let's do uh -huh. it. So, um, Gerald, I love what Levi's and Strauss is doing with the Red Tab Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about it? And has it provided an increase in employee morale and loyalty? Yeah, it does. And I think it just represents, you know, one piece of what the company stands for. And there's a long history, uh, and I'll give credit to Chip Berg, uh, our current CEO, mm -hmm. who continues to embrace it and continues to champion social issues unapologetically. Yeah. Um, now, it's not just Chip, right? Because all of this, the board approves our stance on a lot of things, whether it's gun control, whether it's, uh, you know, social equality, whether it's, you know, women's rights and equity, fair equity, and all, all these issues obviously are driven from the board decision, the Haas family, all the way to the CEO continues to champion those things. Um, and the Red Tab Foundation reflects that, right? So it continues to reflect being able to do, do good. It goes back to how we started the conversation. Mm -hmm. Employees appreciate being a part of something special customers appreciate being a part. Today's customer wants to know how was that child treated that I'm going to have a, where I'm going to have this thing, right? Yes. Like, was he in a, a great farm with a lot of love and <laughs> green grass? And how was it processed? How did it get to my table, right? Farm to table. They want to be able to, to literally see that and choose their place they're going to have dinner reservations and experience and know what it stands for. It's not, it is a great steakhouse great distance, short line, good service. It's the whole pack. Yeah, right? it's the and experience. People want an experience. They want it all. They want yes. it all. They want to be a part of something that they can feel is, is special, right, and have the moral fa fabric mm -hmm. that they aspire to. Now, sometimes that's not who they are, <laughs> but that's who they aspire to. Yes. They want to be a part of it. And I think Red Tab represents that for the organization, for our employees, and for our customers. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a great selling tool uh, for the company. It's a great thing to be a part of. And we, we talk about Red Tab every year. We get the leaders together. And it's a fantastic, fantastic, you know, charity. And um, the organization helps so many people. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, but it it's just represents where the company stands. And yeah. I think it's a great reflection of that. You know, there's a quote that says charity, charity begins at home, you know, 14, 1400 emergencies averted, 540 financial futures improved, 1.75 million in cash grants to help those at home. I mean, very impressive. And it, it does lend, it lend itself to the, um, the fiber of the organization. There's always the stories. Right. Yes. Um, and I met one of the young ladies and reminded me of so many people I knew, right? So many people I know. And, and she just was a, I mean, she was just a really great person who had very unfortunate things happen. And, you know, growing up the way I grew up, I grew up in the projects, not knowing I was, I had a great childhood. Mm -hmm. But as I grew older and as I started to matriculate into middle class and acquired things and things, you always worry, what if something happens, right? right? Like, it's just me and there's no parachute. And what, you know, this person talks about that parachute. Right? Wow. And we don't know what that means until it happens, right? Like, we, I hope that never happens to any of us that we know. Yeah. But like, to know that there's a parachute um, of people who step in and say, you know, we've got you because you yeah. belong to this family. There's a fabric that you're connected to that will be there. 
And I think when you hear it personally, it's great to hear a story that doesn't have a face, but when you hear it personally, you're like, wow, okay, I teared up. But then when you sit there later on, and I'm talking about this specific scenario with me, we yeah. happened to be sitting at the table at dinner. And it wasn't about the story of what happened to that person. It was about him just laughing with a person that I met. And to understand that this is the same, this, this is no different than my neighbor. This is no different than somebody whose kid plays with my kid. This is no different than somebody I grew up with. This is just something that happened to somebody. And it really made me think of like, wow, we provided a parachute when this, someone might not have otherwise had it. Yeah. And that, you know, that you feel proud of. That, mm-hmm. that you're happy that it's there. Right? It's That's definitely something about. to That's be proud of. <laughs> it's the village, right? Yes. It's, it, it's what, we, what we should all have. Yes, yes. Gerald, who are three people who have helped you grow as a leader on your career path and what lessons have you learned from them? It's a great question. <laughs> Three people. This, um, you know, I've had a lot of people around me yeah. who I've stolen from. And I try to take what they, you know, how they lead, how they made me feel, and things that I've watched as an example. So, wow, I wouldn't have thought to do that. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, so, well, you know, what a, what a way of leading or, or being a leader or really showing something that I, I would want to show as a quality myself. Um, there are a lot of people who I, I've, you know, it would be unfair for me to point to, to, to just three, but I'll point to examples. <laughs> yeah, uh, share, share some of the lessons. I'll, I'll share some examples. Um, I had a, uh, a past leader who was two or three levels up. We happened to live in the same marketplace. And he'd ask me about my son and these things. And I look up one Saturday and he's at my son's football game. Hmm. And I'm like, wow, I'm coaching on the sideline. And it's not, we didn't live down the street from each other. And it was just his personal time where he's like, I want to get to know the people in my organization. Mm. Um, he challenged the hell out of me as an individual contributor to help develop me and didn't cut me any slack, uh, but kept giving me opportunities. Right? I remember saying, well, I'm too busy. I can't do it. He's like, no, you're going to do this. Because mm-hmm. right? he wanted me to continue to develop. And that's a commitment, right? That's, that's a commitment to right. the team members. Then there's, you know, there's other individuals who just led with such dignity um, as a minority woman in our industry, which, you know, we're probably 1%, just, you know, right. African-American in my industry is not, is just not many. And uh, she's an African-American woman who led our, you know, who was leader of my team at the time. She always led with such dignity. Always led with dignity, but always very, very sharp, of course, right? That's it. You'll never be, you know, to get to that position. I'm sure she, she had to always exemplify that. Um, but always led with dignity, always had a professionalism. And I always wanted to represent that as someone who worked for her. Mm-hmm. Um, coincidentally, we work together today and she's on my team, right? So I love the, the, the change. Yes. And, you know, but again, that professionalism, that dignity, that quality of person probably had said very similar comments back to me that I said to her probably 15 years ago, that you can always count on me, you'll trust that I always respect you as a leader, and that I'll always make sure that, you know, you shine, Mm -hmm. right? Because I felt compelled to share that with another African-American woman. And I don't think she ever remembers it, but she ended up saying similar, the same to me. And I was taken by that, right? So, um, but I think that speaks to the quality, the leadership, Mm-hmm. That, you know, that again, I resemble those things because I always wanted to show up the way I saw her show up that I was always proud to see. There were there were other leaders who just really led from a place of you knew they were the smartest person in the room. Mm-hmm. You know they had unbelievable brilliance, but left from a place of humility, who left from a place of kinship, mm. who got to know you and valued you. And I was one recent uh, leader who was, who, who was uh, my boss, who I look back now and I said, man, I was absolutely one of the best leaders I've ever had. And super smart, super brilliant, but just a great person. I'd sit down and have a glass of wine with or beer, and, you know, laugh and joke about family and exchange. And, um, and that to me is leadership because mm-hmm. I'd run through a wall with and for because she was fantastic. Wow. Um, 
But those are the types of leaders that inspire me. Um, like I say, I want to have the humility. I really, I really try, and I know um, I got to check myself, right? That you don't have all the answers. Um, and I try to have fun. I mean, you know me, I like to laugh. I like yeah. to enjoy what I do. Um, but I am obs- I'm obsessive, and I want a team that's obsessive. Right? I'm obsessive with um, doing a good job. I'm obsessive with there's a winning factor mm-hmm. that I winning for me internally of executing and doing a good job and exceeding expectation. And I want a team that's obsessive in the same way. And when you, when you grow a team like that, they're going to grow other people like that. They're going to learn from you. And that, that's how you multiply those behaviors that you want to see. John Maxwell says, people do what they see, not what you say. And so when you exemplify commitment, dignity, humility, and they see that in their their leadership, there's something about that. It's like, wow, if if he can do it or she can do it, I can do that. I can do that, you know, as I lead from where I am, I can do that if I'm leading in another organization. And those are the the lessons, the, the gifts, the small gifts, I like to call them that. Um, become a part of you that you can can take with you and absolutely use in any environment, right? Because we don't just lead at work. We lead at home. We lead in the community. We lead um, in our church or synagogue or mosque. You know, we we always have an opportunity to to lead. And I, I love what you said about the, those lessons, you know, commit showing up for, for someone because I want to get to know the people on my team. I think that's so important. And, and leading with dignity and respect and in humility, it definitely goes. Um, it definitely goes a long way. So thank you for sharing those with us. So Gerald, what are, what are you reading that we should be reading? I know you're in school right now. So what, what are you reading that we should be reading? You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, that's the one. But you know, only thing I'm reading right now is case studies. Yes. And, and, uh, you know, I I'm. Listen, I didn't wear these glasses much or glasses much at all. I've been 20, 20 all my life. And then I didn't roll on this program. And all I'm reading is case studies and books and uh, and numbers nonstop, crunching numbers. So I don't have an opportunity to do much, much leisure reading. And it's it's tough. You know, I do enjoy some of the, you know, like you talk about those algorithms. Yes. Of getting into the algorithms on, you know, more motivational. Uh, pieces. Um, you know, again, I still have a emerging young adult and my son, mm-hmm. and an emerging child and my daughter. And, you know, how do I, become, I'm a different parent. You know, mm-hmm. I, damn it, you do what I say, you know, <laughs> those days are over. It's like, how, how do I help him to see the world differently sooner than I did? Right. Mm. And um, so I love the motivational pieces. I love the different perspectives on how people think and how they approach things. The last you know, piece that I read before graduate school that was uh, really good was, um, what is the name of this book? It was a guy who trained Jordan and Kobe. And it was a phenomenal read, for mm-hmm. even a business leader, right? It was just, a, it, I felt so motivated to like just go. And it was just a mindset. Um, and I thought that, you know, I gave, I bought like three copies, gave them to people, gave one of my son, gave it to other people. And I, I think his name is Tim Scott, but it, it was, you know, that was the last thing I read, but I still try to, you know, if I, if I have a moment and I'm doing social media things, it's things like that that I enjoy picking up on. I'm also, as you probably see from photos behind me, is, you know, I like African American history. Yeah. So African American history is, you know, things that taught as a young adult or a young student, um, I find fascinating. Um, I find enriching. It instills pride. Mm -hmm. And, but I love the history. I love to know the truth. I love the history. And I think that's the thing that I didn't talk about, but I share with my teams. You know, I just took on two new teams at, at work and, you know, I like to learn. Yes. Like, that's the obsession. Like that, that's the like, okay, what don't I know? So I'm inquisitive. I'm like, okay, if you're going to take me through a presentation, I got, I have questions all along the way. Like, okay, well, what does this mean? 
And that helps me pull all the things together. We talk about leadership. I right? like first, I gotta lead myself first, right? Like how do yes. I how do I become more informed? I love it, right? I love being inquisitive. I love engaging in these conversations of, and it's more learning. Mm-hmm. And those are the fabrics of like the things that I, I try to push for. So sorry I couldn't give you a book, but you know, I'm still looking for those things that I don't know. Well, when you find out uh, the name of that book that you were, were reading, let us know and we'll put it in the show notes or okay. um, just let me know. So in there thanks. somewhere, I'm like looking at them all. I'm like, I know I had that. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Great. We've been chatting with Gerald Estime, Vice President of Real Estate for Levi Strauss and Company. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Visit the show notes to see how to connect with Gerald. Grab a copy of Results Driven organizations, the four keys to a high performance workplace, and our special gift to you for being a valued listener. Until next time. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Results Driven Organizations podcast with Dr. Tanya Lowe. Be sure to review the show notes for the resources mentioned, and don't forget to grab your free gift available at freegiftfromtanya.com. Until next time.